very friendly textbook for me, like Davis and others. Uh, oh, by the way, Warren here is hoping to see me. So that's why he's here. Yay. He stole my name off. I did. <laughs> but, oh, is that right? <laughs> You're right. Okay, so that was a screw up when I thought Fred was going to be the TA. We switched him around. So <laughs> Warren is the TA. Fred will be the TA for field class. So thank you. Sorry about that. So uh, Warren Elm was the TA. So you, we'll all get familiar with each other by the end. Uh, this is all kind of the general BS that we go through, but there's some things I want to go through here at this stage just to. So you know I told you this, right? Um, the, uh, you can read the objectives, so we'll talk about some of this again in the session, this reading problem, which is what the whole exam is about today. Your, the grades of this class are gonna be two exam and a final, uh, and the final is worth slightly more. Don't ignore this. I'm gonna give you a bunch of homework and quizzes. Some of them will be online. I had two pinheads last year who refused to do online assignments and lost a full letter grade. By, all you have to do is do them, right? They can even just keep at them until you get 100. And they didn't do them. So don't do that, OK? Uh, <laughs> don't throw away your grades. There's no reason to do that. Uh, there, so that's just part of the, the, the lecture part of the class. And then the lab grading, I'll go over the lab in a second. That's, most of the assignments are together, and there's going to be a final project in the lab. Uh, and it'll be kind of tied together with what we do at SEDS. It'll be a, from a field trip and some work up from the field trip at the very end of the class. Uh, I, I wanted to go over this part because I didn't do this last year, and it confused people. Uh, this class got switched around. It used to be a four-hour class. Now it's a three-in-one. So there's three-hour lecture and one-hour uh, lab. I could have done that by just treating it the same way and just pooling the grade for Chris right across the board. But I decided to do it differently in that most of the time I will do that. Or actually, I shouldn't say that. Most of the time I will just count the lecture and the lab separately for a grade. So effectively, what that can do is make it plus or minus, right? So if you get a B in the class and an A in the lab, you effectively get a B plus grade for the class. So it's to your advantage in that particular regard. Uh, what I did do last year is I reserved the right to pool the grades and give you an average grade. And that can be greatly to your benefit because if you do well in the lab and you have problems in the lecture or vice versa, that you can work out the average out and pull it up above an average. So I, use, I just work them out one way or the other. I give you the benefit of the doubt, whichever works out best for you. So, so don't come back to me and complain at the end of the semester that I had an A in lab uh, or whatever, and I had a C in whatever, why I didn't get an A in lab, right? That's because I probably tried to save you from some other thing. Uh, and this is the usual UTEP BS about all kinds of stuff that like <laughs> my wording. Uh, but I did put in here the importance of make sure you do these quizzes, if they're online or when they're in class, uh, and the homeworks. And please get them everything in on time. Warren hates it. When you hand him something at the end of the presentation, I play dirty work on the homework, right? <laughs> but he and I both hate this because it's in this to your disadvantage when stuff comes in late because then we can't hand it back and then you can't look at it to see what you did wrong. So make sure if you have homework and stuff, make sure it's in on time. Yes, sir? Maybe we should mention the lab policy now, too. Um, a lot of you guys have these for anthology and there's a little more lax in there because the lab's the way we orchestrate it. But these yeah. ones are, we've got them all worked out. Terry knows exactly what we're doing. So if you turn stuff in, I think we discussed this policy last time because we get a lot of late ones. If you turn stuff in late, the best you can do is the lowest grade is someone that turns in yeah. on time. So yeah, here's, here's the other part of that policy, right? If you're a day late, you lose your letter grade. Two days, you two letter grades. And then after three, you know, it's the best you can do is the lowest grade in the class. And they go from there, right? right. But it's better than a zero to still turn it in. Uh, but you're not going to get any feedback. So it, and it's, it's really to your benefit and all the rest of the class, so people are not waiting for us to turn stuff back. Okay? Uh, questions about any of this so far? This is it. Yes? 
Yeah, so those will be on Blackboard, not on mine. Okay. Uh, we'll do some in-class stuff too, or some just ha homework that you know, paper assignment or whatever. Right? Make sense? Any other questions about that kind of stuff? Uh, okay, so here's the tentative schedule. Uh, it's always tentative for me. I've never put in a you know schedule, so it's always just crude. But they're they're basically three parts of this class in general. Uh, and that's why it's divided into the three basic exams. We'll start with some introductory material. And then we'll go into what I usually talk about is theoretical structural geology, which is just sort of nuts and bolts of how you understand how rocks are formed. It's, it's a math challenge. People hate this, but I try to simplify it as much as you can to, to deal with it. Uh, and that'll be about the first three or four weeks. Uh, then the next part is essentially description and recognition of geologic structure. The lab is going to be doing a lot of this as well. Uh, but we'll drive it. This is terminology at infinitum and nuts and bolts of how you recognize geologic structure. And we'll do again, we'll do a lot of that in the lab as well. But that's kind of the, the basics of the of the basic descriptive structural geology. And then the last part of the class and when I did there, I'm a dummy. Uh, starts here, uh, which is basically structural association. And I always tell people that what's the first thing they, well, I, here's, here's my one I always tell. How many, now that you're a geologist and you're far enough along, how many of your old friends come up and hand you a rock and ask you, what is it? Right? <laughs> We've all had that one, right? And what's the first question you ask? Where'd you get it? It's the same problem in structure, right? The association can be extremely helpful to tell you what to expect. Um, you know that certain types of structures form in certain kinds of settings. You know, there's a lot of the history of a certain area. Regionally, you have a lot. You can expect certain classes of structures. And so if you find something that deviates strongly from that, that's probably almost more interesting than, than what you're looking at. But at any rate, it's, it's extremely helpful. So we'll talk, that last part will be in that particular context. Uh, and then partly buried in there is also a description of the rock stack that you get from the terrain. Uh, so there's final, the final exam will be kind of a mix of, of, of introductory and final and, uh, and overview material. Um, lab will cover mostly in lab on Friday, but this Friday we're going to go out in the field. And I think Dr. Langford probably already told you that. But come prepared to get these lab supplies. At least by Friday, make sure you have a good pencil, some colored pencils, a, uh, a notebook, a field notebook, so you can do some, uh, some field work. But we're just going to go out to Cristo Rey. It's going to be hotter than hell, but you know, it's that time of year. And uh, so sunscreen and a hat and all that kind of thing. Um, and then after that, it's going to be a series of labs. You can kind of, I'm not going to go through this in any detail. Uh, but, and, and Langford said, you guys objected to one of the field trips, so we can work with, with you on maybe changing the timing of one of those field trips. Uh, but you can go through those, we'll, we'll work our way through them mostly in the lab. Now, any questions? I don't want to, I don't like going over schedules, it's just, I want to make sure it's as clear as possible. No more questions? No questions? And engineers scale? Ah, yes. Important item. They're like an inch long ruler. There's two different, they're triangular. Are these triangular rulers? Mm. I'll, I'll bring an example and try pounding you to remember the name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't miss it. It's just a triangle. Uh, they have, there's two different kinds of scales that are triangular rulers. One of them has like fractions and stuff on it. Not that one. It's called an architect's ruler. They are useless. But <laughs> the engineer scale, has numbers like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 around it. And what you can see is those are division, those are divisions per inch. And so if, if we were in metric, you wouldn't have to do this, but American system, you know, you gotta deal with this. But what it does is it gives you a, a lot of scale variation that's extremely useful for using scales on a map. Mm -hmm. Because you can almost always find something that's a convenient division to, to scale for the map. And I will use some examples, especially. Uh, I know what I forgot to mention. Hang on a second. 
I, I, I glossed over the introductory engineer. So there's one thing I'm going to do differently this year, and I haven't in the past. I'm going to make you read scientific literature. Uh, last year's field class drove me crazy. Uh, so they didn't even know how to properly reference things, which just comes out of reading the scientific literature. So I'll periodically hand you a paper out of random out of the published literature on something from structural geology, and I have to write you a little one-page summary of the paper. And that's pooled into the homework and, and quizzes for the assignment. It's a good practice to make you read the literature, see what it's like, and, and so forth. It'll help you when you have to start learning to write yourself and see how other people do it. So another thing to learn about helping you read. Uh, does that make sense? So I'll, I'll give you details of that when I give it to you at the end. So, questions? Okay, I wore your talk way too long because I wanted to go to the first quiz. Let me do one thing before we start. Uh, let me begin here today. Can you still build one? Where's my... Five minutes. And I want to I give you a strange little quiz, but let me get started in the, on this and we'll go from there. Uh, that's, I never changed the title, that's the old title of the class. Uh, in structural geology, I always like to start to remind you what a class is when you start off. Uh, but I'm leading into some other things. Uh, structural geology is a is a sort of a diverse field. It merges with tectonics and merges with parts of mineralogy and petrology. And those fields blur together. Like all of geology, it's kind of difficult to, to deal with what you call structural geology. But this is my favorite definition, which is the definition out of your book. Uh, and you can read that. It's basically the key word, the architecture of the Earth's lithosphere that results from deformation of rocks, uh, and yada, yada. Uh, the key word in that the statement is the word deformation, because that's what structural geology is about. You take some rock body that started out in some con initial condition, and it becomes something else. And that gives rise to various kinds of secondary structure, which are the object of this particular class. And I always like to think of structures as the three Fs, which is not what you want to get as a grade in this class, right? Uh, but those three Fs are faults, folds, and fabric. I'll tell you this many, many times. But those are the features that are the product of rock deformation. And, and structural geology is a study of those three kinds of features and how they relate to each other and what they tell us about the Earth. Uh, in, in this class, we'll also talk about the theory of deformation which is comprised of two different general topics, or different levels of complexity. And those of you who've had physics might recognize this in the context of kinematics and dynamics. In the first physics class you take, we always first introduce you to kinematics. And kinematics is simply a description of motion without the description of the forces that got you there. Uh, whereas dynamics includes a full description of motion and the forces that are applied to something in that particular context. In geology, it's getting from each of these levels, from, a, from a, basically from a description, which is what we see or observe, to a kinematic description, to a dynamic description, is a different level of complexity, such that the hardest problem is to understand the dynamics of rock deformation. We often jump right to that description but it's the hardest problem because it has to go through a series of steps to actually get you to that understanding. Some problems are easy to do like that, some of them are hard to do that way. So, and here I just jumped ahead. So the, if you will, the, that's related to what we call the levels of structural analysis, where the most first thing you do in any description is make a description or understand the geometry. And from the geometry and various features within the rock mass, you might be able to do kinematics or the motion history that gave rise to those systems. The simplest example, I'll go through this in detail, but the simplest one you might think about this way is 
sedimentary bed rotated. That's a kinematic description. So it just rotates, right? Uh, but if you want to add to that the forces to make the rotation, then that, that, that's a dynamic rotation, or whatever the, the rock dynamics were that made it change. And that involves a different level of complexity. So all of structural geology is woven into that kind of a discussion of these sort of three different levels. And each one of them becomes increasingly complex. Uh, some of these are probably, some aspects are probably unresolvable, like any of the other geologic problems. But at any rate, the key thing we're trying to get to, why I'm talking, doing this right now, is 3D problems are extremely prominent in this class. Yeah, so if you are a 3D challenge, this class is harder for you than other people. And I've learned through the years that people have an amazingly wide variety of abilities on doing 3D problems. The problems are actually four-dimensional because they're three-dimensional in time. When you, put the, when you think about the kinematics of a three-dimensional formation of a three-dimensional object. Uh, what we do typically in structural geology, like most of us do, is use 2D crutches which help us understand 3D problems. And our, 3D, our 2D crutches are geologic maps, which are more or less a two-dimensional representation on the surface of the Earth, cross-sections, cut through resources, and we will do cross-sections in this class, uh, geophysical images of the subsurface, which we won't do much of in this class, there are four other classes taught on that, and a few sort of more obscure sources that come into play. But one of the things you'll learn in this class, this is a very famous structural geologist talking to an African geologist, uh, it's actually really helps to put your hands in the air, right? Uh, we all think, I've learned this now, about the way we all think, uh, visualizing things, it actually helps to, to use your hands and things like that that actually can help to visualize three dimensions. We all, we, I, this is what I learned from psychologists is that, that you learn this as a child, right? You reach out and grab things and you look at things and you look at them in different dimensions and look at them in different ways. That manipulation is actually helps you to understand three dimensions. Uh, so if you have three dimensional problems yourself, make use of what crutches you have. The two dimensional representations can develop our ability to look at a three dimensional problem. So to deal with that in front of you is in fact a 3D spatial abilities exam. And it's divided into a bunch of little questions that range from reading a topo map to some complicated little things about ro manually rotating figures. And so take the rest of the class, do that exam, and we'll stop about 5.30.